Hi, I'm John Sovey, and this is Art and Design. Today, our guest is David Gariff from the National Gallery of Art. David, thank you so much for coming on the show today. I appreciate it. Well, thank you for the invitation. I'm happy to be here. <laughs> so, David, what is your official title at the National Gallery of Art? Uh, I'm what we call a senior lecturer. It's a position comparable to being, you might say, a professor within the confines of the uh, of the gallery. I'm not a curator per se, so I'm technically in ed the education division. Uh, what led you to that position? Well, <laughs> that, that's a that's a very long story. Um, I actually never anticipated being in a museum uh, all through my graduate studies and even before that. My interest was to be a university professor, and and I have that was the bulk of my career and I'm still affiliated with universities that are here in DC. But um, I was actually, it was strange because I had, uh, I was in Wisconsin, but because I had done my graduate work at the University of Maryland, I was very familiar with the DC area. And uh, it was now, it's been 20 years actually, uh, an opening came up in the, um, what we would call, we've changed so many names, but it used to be called adult programs to be a lecturer. And so uh, that's how I ended up here. I've been here for 20 years now. I came in 2004. And it flew by. It actually has, yeah. I'm, sometimes, <laughs> I, sometimes I feel very, very old. <laughs> not, not even. So I was, I was gonna say that um, in the last, I, I guess the last year or so, and it's probably been a little longer than that, um, a lot of the lectures that you do and the tours that you do at the National Gallery of Art have been put on YouTube. When did that get started? Well, that, again, uh, there are so many changes going on because we have a new director now, so the gallery is changing a lot of its directions. But in terms of those videos that are on YouTube, it uh, I think it really got going when we had... Um, Redesign the National Gallery, which is the modern building that has 20th and 21st century art. We closed that, I think it was in 2013, and took a three year period to renovate the entire museum that the East Building to create more exhibition space to reinstall all the galleries. Uh, it was a huge undertaking, and the curator who was in charge was was Harry Cooper, who's our curator of uh, modern art. Of course, that building is a, a landmark since it was designed by I.M. Pei. And so there were, and by that time, I.M. Pei was close to 100 years old. He died not long after that. So a, a Pei associate, an architect from his firm had to be on site to see what it was that we hoped to accomplish. And after all of the work was done and all these new elements were added, we added a sculpture terrace and et cetera, a, a number of things. Uh, I, I decided actually to present to the public, it was a 14 part lecture series where I would just basically walk people through the new installation so that they would know now how the gallery had changed because it had changed markedly. And uh, that's that was the origin. But even before that, there had been an interest in putting some of my videos uh, up on YouTube and, and also on the, on the uh, National Gallery website. So I think now if we combine both audio and video, I have something like 57 different talks that are available. <laughs> well, I am a big fan and I'm really happy that you're on the show today because um, I got so lost in these lectures the last year and um, really it's, it's, it's amazing the amount of background that you put into each one of these lectures and the passion. Um, some of my favorites are what you've done with David Smith and his legacy and uh, kind of taking a sidetrack here. Your dad was a, a welder. My dad was a sheet metal worker and a welder and uh, I'm from upstate New York from Rochester and uh, he worked for years for Eastman Kodak. Uh, in the physical plant. And uh, so I'm very familiar with Detroit. I, I taught in Cleveland for 11 years. I'm kind of, that's my 
home territory. And I sort of, so I identify with the uh, so-called Rust Belt cities, uh, <laughs> where I, especially Rochester, where I, which I have, I have a great affection for, for Rochester, even though I went on to live in many other places. So I David Smith, speaking of welding, yeah, I, I was one of the few people who could actually talk to people about how great that bead of weld was uh, in a particular David Smith sculpture. Well, it comes out in your, in your, uh, there's a two part lecture that you have on David Smith right. that I'm going to highlight. And, um, it really comes out and it shows your passion for his craft and what he was doing at a time when there wasn't many people in the, uh, modern art realm that were actually welders that could actually fabricate these things and all your little anecdotes, um, in your lecture series, it makes you, uh, very personable and passionate about the topic. And I'm like, did I mention I'm glad we're talking today? Because you, I'm sorry, you, you froze up. Uh, oh, I was just saying, I'm, did I mention I'm yes. glad we're talking today? Because uh, I really enjoy all of your series. And I'm going to make sure we have links to it be below this interview today, too. Oh, well, I'm, I mean, I'm very pleased to hear that. Most often, I mean, obviously, I get feedback from sort of the local audience, but I'm never quite sure who's seeing these things as they go out and into the sort of into the ether. Um, I, uh, I certainly, I'm very familiar with your work and because one of my interests actually, which relates to David Smith is uh, public sculpture and the whole idea of um, constructing welding. Uh, and so um, I think your city, the, your um, project about man in the city is, is fascinating. One. Well, thank you. Uh, that was unsolicited, too, by the way. Um, yes. yes. <laughs> hey, we, um, we didn't rehearse that. <laughs> so did you spend a lot of time at Bolton's Landing then? Yeah, I've, I made two visits up there two different times, but it was years before I was at the National Gallery because upstate New York was sort of an area that I loved, and I loved the Catskills and the Adirondacks. And so I would, uh, and I have a very good friend who's a, a sculptor, uh, Who's very talented, and he has he works in Wells, New York. So he's up he's up in the Adirondacks. His is name that is John? John John Van Alstein. We've had him and, on the show. Oh, have you really? Yeah. Oh yeah. Oh oh yeah. I wrote well when I was at Cleveland. I curated an exhibition of John's work because we were together. It's a strange. The world is very small, but he <laughs> he, he had come to the University of Maryland to be a, a professor when I was a graduate student there. And so we met at the University of Maryland, and then we kept in touch. And he knew about my my interests in sculpture, and um, I actually we worked together to convert his studio. He, he rented a studio space in D.C., and uh, I always wanted to do an exhibition. And then finally, I got a chance to do do it in Cleveland. Oh, that's great! Where at in Cleveland? I, it was at Cleveland State University. I taught at Cleveland State University for about eleven years. I've my basically my career has been a teacher professor and only and even when i came to the national gallery essentially i still think of myself as a teacher I'm, i although i work with the curators and other things yeah uh we did john's interview during covid and he walked us through his uh studio and his home and the, the houses along the river um, oh, it was a great great interview uh, yeah I'm, and then he was i'm so I think pleased was, to hear that yeah he was preparing for is it Daniel Chester French's house that he had in right. exhibit. Yeah, right. th that was right. fascinating too. So, yeah, he's a well, nice I'm, guy. I'm very happy to hear that. Yeah, I, I think very highly of John and of his work. No, I, I, I enjoyed him. I liked every bit about it. So, and uh, you know, the other thing that you mentioned, um, uh, because you, you've got a lot of focus on the abstract, uh, abstract expressionists, and you mentioned uh, several times the Cedar Tavern. And I noticed you did a little research and found that it was in Austin. Yeah. Uh, and did you tell me or who told me that it was your friend who oh, yeah, purchased my, uh, it or dismantled it was, actually, it? it was my roommate from college, actually, was wow. the one who suggested to the owners that they buy that bar and install it at uh, Eberly Restaurant in, uh -huh. um, in Austin. And it was incredible. It was a 10-year journey from New York yeah. to Austin. So you had a chance to do a little research on that. I was I was excited to hear that. I'm always fascinated by 
sort of the collaborative nature where, where artists have a place that they meet and talk and that it cuts across all boundaries. I, I mean, it can be it can be a specific lo sort of location like a like a bar, but it, more specifically thinking about, say, Paris in the 20s. Um, and just this this interchange, I'm very interested in the contextual nature of things. I actually started in history before I moved to art history. I'm very interested in linking art up to music and literature and architecture and philosophy and other things. So the Cedar Bar was like this uh, crucible, quite, quite frankly, where people would come and when they weren't drinking and getting drunk, they were discussing important ideas. And I think it's important for artists, and it has always been important for artists, to have those kinds of places. Well, you do a great job. There's a couple of things during the Abstract Expressionist um, presentation that you did on YouTube where you, you went in depth on the tavern. And I was like, oh, this is fantastic. And you had some great photos of... Uh, yeah. Chamberlain at the bar and right. uh, it, was, it was so great. I, I'm pushing for you to do another uh, whole series on that, on that because, oh my God, it was, it was so great to hear you go off on the different avenues that you can do, which there's a million of them when, it call, yeah. when you talk about the bar. You know, we just closed the big Philip Gustin show that now is going to go on to the Tate in London. And there's a wonderful story about uh, Philip Gustin and, and Willem de Kooning. Uh, at the Cedar where Gustin had this incredible work ethic. He would work for 36 hours straight sometimes. And so at one point he had had a long day in the studio and he comes to the Cedar uh, bar and uh, Willem de Kooning is at the, is at the bar seated on a bar stool. And uh, Gustin comes up and is just, he's just smiling. He doesn't actually say anything. He just has this big grin on his face. And de Kooning looks at him and says to him, good strokes today? <laughs> <laughs> because he could just tell that obviously Gustin had a great day in the studio. <laughs> well, another anecdote that you you threw out um, was uh, um, Rauschenberg walks in and says, well, I got to yeah. find another bar. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Rauschenberg, you know, because he came out of that milieu, or he really started with the abstract expressionist. It was so difficult for those younger artists like Johns and Rauschenberg to get it from out from under the shadow of those guys because they had become, you know, legends even when Rauschenberg was still around. So, uh, yeah, he was not, <laughs> that wasn't the bar for Robert Rauschenberg or Jasper Johns. <laughs> It's it's amazing, and it, I mean, it could be a mini series. There's so much information <laughs> that, that that happened at that time period at that gathering place, boy. But it was great, and you 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 put such a great um, uh, like all the again the anecdotes. Uh, one of my other favorites, and I'm just hitting the highlights, uh, which there are many, is um, Helen Frankenthaler saying how Hans Hoffman actually could hear, but he would hold that horn up to his ear when he didn't <laughs> want to listen to people. Oh my God, you make my day. I'm telling you, I, I enjoy every bit of your, uh, your series. Yeah. So. Well, I love, I mean, I have to say, I love the New York school. I love that period. I love the city in that period. And not just with the visual artists, but everybody else, you know, John Cage and Merce Cunningham and the whole crew who were really, again, it was sort of like Paris in the 20s when you had the Ballet Russe and Diaghilev and Nijinsky and, and uh, Stravinsky and everybody. It was our version of that in the United States. So it's an exciting, I, 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 I am a diehard modernist. I know we've moved beyond modernism to post-postmodernism, post, post <laughs> mm -hmm. um, but that period, modernist art still for me is, it, it, that's my touchstone. Well, uh, I want to highlight some of your other um, locations because is it the Smithsonian that you do tours for? Yeah, I've been affiliated with the Smithsonian even long before I came to, um, to Washington when I was uh, living in Cleveland. Uh, First, I started to do a number. My one of my areas of interest is Italian art, Italian Renaissance art, and um, so I was asked to lead when the Smithsonian does 
these journeys abroad, they send what they call a study leader who lectures to the people. So I did a number of programs for the Smithsonian uh, lecturing uh, in uh, mainly in, for their Italian trips. And then they also have what they call the, uh, used to be called the resident associates program. Now it's just called the associates program. And that is um, uh, just a lecture series and they invite people of all different stripes, all different backgrounds and disciplines to lecture at the Smithsonian. But since the pandemic, they've been really doing almost everything by way of Zoom. So I, I started doing that. I won't give you the year, but it's been a long, <laughs> long time. Uh, and this summer, that I've been doing a series that they seem to like on art and literature. And so I just finished a three-part series for the summer where I took topics. I did Gertrude Stein and Picasso. I did uh, Walker Evans and James Agee. And I did another talk on William Blake, who was both a poet and a painter himself. So that's been my current interest, this series on art and literature. So how does that work? People can sign up through the Smithsonian? This is the shameless yeah, promotion can, part? Yeah, you can uh, become an associate, a member, um, and then you they just you just have to register for the talk, and, uh, and that's that. I, you can tune in, even if you're not a member, because they advertise these pretty wide, wide, widely, and then I don't know exactly how that works, but it's you can also uh, access the talks even if you're not a member of. Uh, but the it's called the resident. Well, no, the Smithsonian Associates. That's the program, and they produce a catalog about four times a year um, with all of the various talks and the various. I mean, they have Supreme Court justices lecturing, and all, you know, it's a, it's not just about the arts. Ah, uh, well. Uh, we're, we'll definitely put a link to that as well, because um, it's a great opportunity, again, to hear you and the in-depth study that you you present in your lectures. So I'm really looking forward to that. Well, thank you. Yeah, I do have a long, <laughs> long, long history there as well as at the National Gallery. Do you spend time actually at the Smithsonian then? Uh, only if I have to, you know, I mean, I spend time at the various museums if i have sometimes i lecture just locally i lecture at various smithsonian museums but uh the national gallery really takes up most of my time and and i guess most people don't actually realize that the national gallery is actually not a part of the smithsonian um it's, it's we're an independent uh, museum that's how it was set up by andrew mellon um but obviously we're all together on the mall, all of the museums. And so we have a lot of interaction and collaboration. It's a wonderful place to live and work as an art historian, for sure. Uh, I would say that the National Gallery is the greatest hits of all time. And it's it, it's sometimes um, people think of the Met and MoMA and other locations, but the mall is just a treasure trove of history not just the arts, but history in general. And boy, the National Gallery has such a great collection and to be surrounded by it, that's gotta be great, especially feel, redesign. Right, I feel very, very uh, fortunate, very grateful. Uh, I, I never anticipated that I would actually be able to uh, have my a permanent job at the National Gallery. I did my, as I said, I did my PhD at the University of Maryland but then I went off and had a long teaching career in Cleveland and Wisconsin and other places before. Then it turned out that I came back and it just, I tell my students all the time, you, you never know what's around the corner. So just keep yourself open to things that, you know, will come your way. Well, now the, you, you alluded to this earlier, but there was a, a big redesign when it came to modern art at the National Gallery. Right. What year yeah, did that that's when it, we closed. If I remember correctly, we we closed in 2013 because there was no way we could do everything and still keep the museum open. So I mean, the West Building remained open, the old Masters sort of building, but the East Building we totally closed in 2013, and it took three years to um, redesign to put up a sculpt. Now we have a sculpture terrace on the roof. We have two sections devoted on the roof, one to Alexander Calder and one to Rothko and Barnett Newman. 
and then we had additional floor space that was installed. Um, it was a huge project. We had to make different changes for accessibility and things that hadn't been done. That building opened originally in 1978, so a lot of things had changed since then. So it was a huge project. And then that was the time, logically, for Harry Cooper, our curator, to think about, OK, how do we want to um, arrange the collection now? And we, so we've made, we made several changes in that regard. What, um, what's the best way to find your lecture series at the National Gallery of Art? Uh, it's e well, let me say two things. If you do YouTube, that's just easy. You can just do click, you know, just search Gareth. Make sure you spell the name right. It's one R and two F's. Gareth Video National Gallery on YouTube, and they'll probably all pop up. The other way is to go to the National Gallery website itself to our homepage and essentially do the same thing. You can just type in the search video and my last name, Gareth, and my, my series at the National Gallery, they, they should all uh, pop up as well. That's, that's where I do a little shameless promotion. I got to slide that into our interview every chance I get. So, and I highly yeah, there, recommend that. There are two different places, the, the YouTube and, and the National Gallery site. So um, either one will get you kind of hooked up. So David, last question. What, what do you have that you're working on uh, now? What's, well, what's the upcoming projects? Actually, I'm, I'm working on a huge project that is uh, not going to be at the National Gallery, but I'm curating the first major retrospective on a well-known DC artist uh, who passed away in 2015 named Paul Reed. And Paul Reed, in fact, I gave one of the lectures you've referred to was on the DC Color School. And uh, a, a section of that lecture was about Paul Reed. And um, th through a very serendipitous a series of events, the bulk of his collection was given to the Oklahoma City Museum of Art in Oklahoma City. So the exhibition is going to open hopefully in 2025 in Oklahoma, then it's going to come here to DC at the Katzen Center at American University. And then I'm hoping it'll travel and end in Phoenix, Arizona, where Paul had a connection. So Paul was one of the great original members of the what we call the Washington Color School, it included Gene Davis and Howard Marion, Tom Downing. Um, these were the these were supposedly the artists that Clement Greenberg felt were the true successors to the abstract expressionists. And actually, Helen Frankenthaler played a, an important role because it was uh, Greenberg who suggested that Morris Lewis and Kenneth Nolan go to New York to look at what Frankenthaler was doing. And of course, she was staining her canvases on the floor. And that became the hallmark of the Washington Color School, staining instead of sort of active brushwork. Are you doing a catalog for that show as well? Yes, it's a major going to be a major catalog. It'll be the first major catalog. There, he's there were a number of small exhibitions about Paul. I got to know Paul in the last years of his life. I was very fortunate. He lived in Arlington, and um, we just became friends. And it was at that time that, in fact, we acquired. Uh, it was the first. Act, it was kind of ironic and sad, but it was the first Paul Reed to come into the National Gallery. His work is represented all throughout DC. He's in the Phillips Collection, the Hirshhorn, the Krieger, uh, the Smithsonian American Art Museum. And it was, a, it was kind of sad that we didn't have anything at the National Gallery, but now we do. We have a great painting that was donated uh, in the last years of his life. And that, so that's slated for 2025, the show and the catalog. Yeah, we're thinking December 2025 and then traveling it maybe through 2026 to back it has to be here in washington obviously because paul was this was his native city and when he was a boy he and gene davis they went to high school together and they used to ride their bikes to two to two galleries the national gallery and the phillips collection and so they kind of cut their teeth here as as young boys and they sort of said one day we're going to be in these museums and it came true <laughs> <laughs> well and, and he had a chance to see the piece added to the collection. Yeah, I was very, yeah, I was very 
concerned about that. I mean, he lived to be 91, I guess, but I, not only did I want him to be able to see us have the work up and have a little kind of an unveiling, but I wanted to make sure that we weren't going to acquire the work and just put it into storage. I, I wanted him to be able to come and have family come and, and see it. And uh, so we, we did all of that. And there's some, actually there's some images online about that little unveiling. And I remember standing when we had the painting installed and I had been working with Paul for at least three, four years by that time. And I stood with him and we were just looking at the painting and I turned to him and I said, well, what do you think? And he said, I can die a happy man. Well, that was, uh, that's a testament to you and your passion for art. And I have to say, I, I binge watch uh, your, your videos with, with pleasure. Stayed up very late several times in the last couple of months. <laughs> and I'm like, this is amazing. I'm so glad you came on the show too, David. You made my day. And um, mm -hmm. man, I'm, I'm telling you, I'm, I, I can't say enough about your passion and the information that you share in these videos. There's so much to unwrap but you do it in such a personal way. I'm a super fan. I, well, I as I said, I, I mean, I really think of myself as, I think of myself mainly as a teacher. Uh, I've always was against the sort of elitist tag that art history had and the jargon and all of that. I, that's not, that's never been me. And so I, I feel most comfortable when I'm at the podium. Uh, it shows, and I think your audience would agree as well. I highly recommend it. David, thank you for coming on the Art and Design Show. I told you it would fly by. <laughs> yeah. Well, thank you, very, thank you very much, John. And, and good luck and uh, best wishes for your continued success as well. I know you have a lot of great projects. We have many other interests. Ernest Hemingway happens to be another one. Oh, but We'll have well, to save that for another time. Yeah, you can't get rid of me. So I'm just warning <laughs> you right now. And, and thank you. Thank you, uh, because this was an ambush and, and you made it. <laughs> Well, I appreciate it. Thanks, David. Thank you, John.